morning, everyone. Um, this is the uh, Saturday Legislative Roundtable with um, Emily Kornheiser, Tristan Polino, and Molly Burke, your three Brattleboro area uh, representatives to the Vermont House of Representatives. And we have been having, I think now, eight to 10 weeks of conversations. Um, and welcome to the BCTV watching audience. Uh, just this week's conversation, we'll always try to do a brief legislative update. I think we'll save that for the end um, so that we can have a, a conversation around a specific theme, which is something that we started a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the theme today is around food and food security and farming and uh, all, of how, all of what's going on sort of in the COVID relief response and just sort of have a conversation about the systemic issues in, in that space. And so, um, we definitely want to address food security. We want to address access. We want to address anything that's sort of related to that topic. Um, and we have a variety of different people here, uh, as always, and um, people in a position to kind of offer us, I think, sometimes professional expertise or otherwise just lived experience of what's going on out there in, in the world right now. Uh, and so it's pretty wide open ranging conversation. We don't have any formal speakers, so we'll just open it up to any questions or comments. And I think Emily, maybe you had uh, found your sticky note that had some, you didn't find your sticky note, but we can talk about some of the things that happened this week in the legislature that are related to this topic. And uh, I'll, I'll see if Emily or Molly want to go uh, into any of those details and I'll add some uh, in the context of what happened in the um, Commerce Committee uh, yesterday that led to uh, our floor vote in, in a couple of related areas. Um, I don't have my sticky note, so I don't have exact numbers. It was here yesterday, and um, I had um, Margaret Atkinson, who's the co-chair of the Hunger Council, but was not able to be here today. Um, we had a conversation on the Montpelier Happy Hour yesterday, so if folks want to go find that other recorded Zoom conversation and listen to that, you're welcome to deepen this conversation with that conversation. But um, really, I think we've done the with cares act funds we need to be very careful to spend them all by december 30th so it's often a limit on systemic work um but we're able to put a significant many millions of dollars into um, a number of the requests of hunger free vermont and so one of them was to just give a lot more money to the food shelf um sorry to the food bank so that they can have more food to distribute to area food shelves and healthier food um, and ideally more locally purchased food to distribute to area food shelves who are seeing an increased need. We also um, allocated a bunch of money, many millions of dollars, sorry, don't have the exact numbers, um, to um, schools for school food programs. I mean, sorry, it's for summer food programs, which sometimes are through schools and sometimes are not through schools. Um, in our area of Wyndham County, it is the summer food program is run by the school district, but that's not true throughout the state. And so that summer food programs are um, usually happen at congregate sites and that's not possible with COVID. And so really trying to do our very best to continue the delivery, the, the school delivery of meals, which has been happening through the school year since um, children have been at home. And so a lot of funding going to that, both for the transportation costs and otherwise, and Molly can tell us more about that. Um, and then a few other pieces that I think are really important to note um, that were not part of our provisions, but our um, action that the state's ta taking that are really exciting is um, every family in a Wyndham Southeast School District school with a kid in that school or a kid under five um, has received a food stamp card this summer to pay for extra food because every kid that's enrolled in that school is um, because we have universal school meals and we have a very high poverty rate. Every child in that school is eligible for this food stamp card. And so it means that we've entered sort of a realm of opting, having to opt out of services rather than opting into services. And so we're hopeful that a lot of folks who right now might be struggling more than they've struggled before, or perhaps even for the first time in a long time around food security, are going to be able to access these services without having to um, you know, go into an office or fill out a lengthy application. 
for folks who um, want to really convert that one-time card into more extensive um, use of food stamps, the application process is really opened up right now as well in that folks are eligible for the maximum amount and the work requirement connected to food stamps for single adults has been removed. And so really encourage people to also go to the economic services website or go to the economic services office and apply for food stamps because that is the most direct way to address food security in our system, though we do have this incredible network of congregate meal sites and um, food shelves that are also available for people. And then we've added some new layers, which I think we're gonna hear about today. Yep. Molly, do you wanna add anything before I talk about one of the new layers? Yeah, just talking a little bit more about the um, food for the transportation for the um, school meals. I, I was aware that Rattleboro was looking for money to continue the school meal program after the school ended. And our committee was given um, $5 million to figure out, to make a request to uh, appropriations about how that money could be spent. And we um, needed to find some kind of nexus, or at least the people on the committee felt we needed to find a nexus with transportation. So I suggested that we use it for the school bus, knowing I had talked to a Nora Horton of Hunger Free Vermont and finding out that they needed, it's like the, the cost for transportation was 6.4 million. And um, I, and I also knew that the uh, Health and Human Services, the Human Services Committee was creating a sort of an omnibus bill that put a lot of money into different things, this being one of them. It was $12 million for the whole program for the whole state. So anyway, so in the end, the way our committee voted, uh, we were able to take $2 million of that and sort of give it to, uh, contribute it to the transportation part of the school meal delivery program. So I would have liked it to be more, but that's the way committees work. You sort of have to go with the way people vote. Uh, so um, that's pretty much the, the intersection that I've had with the, with the food um, issue. And realizing, I think, also how transportation really, like a lot of times we're dealing with more specific things like projects, but how it really intersects with people's um, uh, lack of income and ability to get around. And uh, so this school meal was a sort of a new version of thinking about what purposes transportation um, serves. So anyway. I think that's all I have to say. Yeah, and I'll add one more piece and then we can open up for other questions or comments from everyone. Uh, one of the new layers that, that we did this week, and just to be clear, when I say we did, um, you know, the, the House um, yesterday passed another uh, substantial uh, amount of spending of the COVID relief dollars from the federal government. And uh, this one was a second phase of economic development dollars, some uh, other uh, hazard pay, um, you know, for frontline workers. Um, and we can talk about that later in, in the update, but it was another substantial um, piece of work. And um, the final, this is not yet on its way to the governor, so the Senate still has uh, to evaluate this proposal, so there may be changes. So we're talking about, you know, based on the current information we have, this is the, the plan that, that we passed, and, and there may be some subtle changes to it. Um, and, but the, one of the new layers is a $5 million program where SEVCA, our Southern, uh, Southeastern Vermont Community Action uh, Agency is the fiscal agent for a statewide project that would use uh, the restaurant community to provide food for uh, folks experiencing food insecurity and, um, and with a requirement to purchase at least 10% of the uh, ingredients from local farms and producers um, and a requirement that they engage statewide um, and across a broad range of restaurant sizes to produce not fewer than 15,000 meals per week. So uh, it's a quite substantial, it's a $5 million program. It's a quite substantial investment in um, an alternative strategy for providing uh, food that that gives some cash flow to restaurants that are currently really struggling to 
have enough cash flow to keep their employees on, you know, on, on hand. Um, and, and, you know, just a side note, you know, for many restaurants taking the PPP dollars from the federal government was, uh, was too risky because they couldn't be sure that they would have enough sales volume to bring all of their employees back. And that created substantial insecurities um, around um, around whether they could afford to take that PPP money, which would become debt if they didn't meet the the payroll requirements. And so this is a way of giving them extra cash flow for for those who have the staff capacity there, um, where they might not have the sales volume. So and so it's a, a really interesting win 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 um, in the sense that it's. Um, uh, it's good for the farm sector because it increases the throughput into the wholesale market. It's good for people who are experiencing food insecurity and it's good for the restaurants because it provides them some, some extra forms of cash flow. Uh, the, um, there was a, an ag um, bill that uh, spent um, 20 something million to support the dairy industry. Um, and, uh, and, but then, um, an, an additional very substantial investment in the Working Lands Program. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, the Working Lands Program has been around for, I think, uh, now six or seven years. And every year it's a question of, you know, how many little bits of money we can find to, to, to put in there. I think its largest single year was 1.5 million in appropriations, but it's, it's an unusual program in that prior to this crisis, most of the time state government did not give grants to for-profit businesses. Uh, Working Lands is a specific grant program uh, that is uh, open to for-profit businesses in the farm sector. So it's, it's agricultural and forest product related funding. Um, incredibly robust network and incredibly strong capacity as a uh, review board to make strategic grants in a variety of different ways. And what we've done with this investment of five million is really given um, many of our ag related and timber related uh, businesses an opportunity to apply for grants that can very quickly help them pivot their businesses or, or address other challenges around how their business is responding to COVID. It, again, like all other money, it needs to go out very, very quickly. And I think the uh, anticipated uh, pushing out of that money is over the next 60 to 90 days. Um, the board is ready to fully engage in that. So assuming that that makes it to the governor's desk, we've got a pretty substantial strategic investment in um, the ag and timber product sector through that mechanism as well. So that just covers a high level of some of the different things that we've done. And I'd love to get some of your voices into the conversation if anyone wants to jump in. And if we wanna, if we could start with folks who are um, sort of here specifically for this conversation, that would be. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, folks who are sort of working, working in the, in the land of food. Um, Lloyd, go for it. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna unmute you. So there you go, okay, great. <laughs> Okay, I'm on that um, 15,000 meals per week statewide. But what, just as a Wyndham slash Brattleboro person, um, what might that uh, equate to in, in terms of, of Wyndham County or Brattleboro? Um, it's not specified. And um, I think that there's uh, um, different... Uh, Sevka's got a different, an interesting challenge because they need to make sure that it's multi, uh, community, multiple community scale hubs across Vermont that are coordinating these efforts in the restaurant industry. Um, they, just so you know, the Downtown Brattleboro Alliance and Mama Says were specifically listed as collaborators and partners to okay. Sevka in this work, um, but also many, you know, the, the CAP agencies in general, um, the Vermont Hunger Council, the Sustainable Jobs Fund Farm to Plate, Vermont Community Foundation, many other partners specifically called out in, in, in the legislative language. So, um, And because um, this project really started with conversations that had in Brattleboro and um, a project in Burlington around the Skinny Pan Pancake Restaurant franchise called Shift Meals, it's likely that the meals will start much sooner 
in Brattleboro and Burlington and then sort of slowly be implemented in other areas as they find capacity to do it. But we're the only two areas that are really ready and rearing to go on this. So likely more meals would be here than might be just if we, you know, divided it by county or population or something. Thanks. Bob? So this, this may be out of order, but um, I got a letter back from the governor the other day about the housing money. And he failed to mention the 23 million that was targeted for folks that are now in hotels. Um, do you know what the status of that is? We passed it yesterday in the House. That was yesterday. Yeah, we passed it yesterday in the House through second and third reading, and it's on its way to the Senate. They um, have their own. We've been sort of working concurrently on the same things in order to move faster, but that also means that everyone is sort of coming into the conversation with set expectations. And so um, it still needs to finish its way next week in the Senate and through something like a uh, um, expedited conference committee process and then go to the governor's desk. But that part um, of the funding was very much done in collaboration with the Agency of Human Services and the administration. And so I feel more confident um, in it because there was such broad agreement that brought us to it. Um, and but next week, we are going to spend the entire time talking about the, all the packages that have passed in the last two weeks and so we can go deeper into housing again then. But knowing that some of these shift meals would be used to feed that population. Yeah. I would just add on the process side that um, as much as possible, the House and the Senate have been coordinating across committees to so that we don't get wildly outside of each other's lanes, you know, so that in a typical session, when we're all in person, it, we might, the House might take a position, the Senate might take a position that are really quite different, substantially different, and it can be weeks and weeks and weeks of co conference committee work to iron out the differences. We do not have the luxury of that. We're already way past the normal time frame for these sorts of things. Um, and so uh, to, to a significant ex extent, uh, the House leadership and the Senate leadership um, so Tim, you know, Senate Pro Tem Tim Ash and, and Senate Majority Leader Becca Ballant, who's one of our senators, you know, very much on the Senate side, trying to coordinate uh, and support their committee chairs, working collaboratively with our committee chairs and our leadership team, so that we're not going to spend weeks to sort out these differences. Um, whether there's whether they're able to just affirm what we did yesterday, I'm not entirely clear on, um, but but hopefully we'll be moving. Pretty quickly to uh, to a, a consensus. Um, so we're going to go to Lisa so, next. Oh, wait, wait, Lisa, wait. I see your Senate, I totally um, do, but we want to um, start with the folks who are working in this work. And um, I thought Bob would be saying something about the incredible congregate meal site he runs, rather than a housing question. So that's why I jumped to him. Um, Lisa, it's your turn. Hang in, little Lloyd. <laughs> Oh. Thanks. Thank you so much. Lloyd, I'll be brief, I promise. <laughs> oh, so, um, yeah. no, I, I, I was just, I was just going to say that Senate and House cooperation, what a novel idea. That's all. <laughs> I mean, the nation should, should pay a little attention. To this. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, the proof is in the pudding, Lloyd, don't get your hopes up yet. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> Both good points. <laughs> um, so uh, we, for the last couple of weeks, we've been um, working with a creamery up north to um, give away free milk at the River Garden in downtown Brattleboro. And they worked with a nonprofit who was able to give them money to be able to process and bottle their milk. And um, since then, another uh, local farm, Hamilton Farm, has reached out asking us if we know of any um, ways that they, they can also be able to bottle and process their milk to be able to give it away for free rather than right now they're just putting raw milk in bottles in front of their farm and people are just going and picking them up but in a way that they could um, uh, you know give away free milk like like uh, the creamery that we're working with up north is doing do you see any of this new cares money um, being able to work in that aspect for some some of the dairy farmers 
Go ahead, Emily. I, um, I think the working lands funding could be used um, for exactly that. Um, I think that's really how it's designed. Um, and then I could also see some of the shift meals money. The idea is that some of, um, that's the Sevka collaboration. Um, I am hopeful that because they're supposed to be doing local purchasing um, and really starting to integrate sort of restaurant infrastructure, um, local production and community need. Um, and because they're using Mama Says that, you know, basically, you know, produces for national audiences, that they're also gonna, would be a path for some of that. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? Of course. Yes. So um, when, when the uh, parameters around how to apply and all of that come out, you know, when, the, when it came out with the food box, it was like, it, it went by so many people so yeah. quickly. Um, so what, like, do you have any idea about how that's going to be promoted, how folks can learn about it as fast as they possibly can? So for the shift meals or, um, I would stay in touch with Stephanie Bonin because she's who I know that you have an easy time staying in touch with, um, because yeah. she's going to be, is one of really the folks who are very much at the table there. And then for the working lands, they have um, a very good sort of mailing list and you could just go to their website if you're not already on it and they will be distributing information about it from their regular um, mailing site. I would love to give the stage back to you, Lisa, to see what, you know, from your professional role supporting agriculture in the region, what else you see as a need that's COVID related um, that might be met by legislation or that you're, um, or might not be met by legislation. Yeah, um, I think that um, getting uh, CSAs into the hands of folks who need it um, is something that we're seeing a lot of need for, but not necessarily sure um, how to partner farmers with um, the folks that, that need that food, mm. or in a way that makes sense. I know Sosu is doing um, some some of that work through Lost River mm -hmm. um, and something like that would be um, uh, I think especially for Brattleboro and you know the, the River Garden I know was at one time a um, housed the uh, winter farmers market but it being a really central location, especially for folks who don't have transportation, who would, you know, could, uh, you know, their apartment is within walkable distance. When we um, started giving out the free milk, um, I contacted Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust and Brooks House um, to see if those folks who, who might um, have a barrier to transportation um, wanted to come and walk down and get some milk. So maybe sort of twofold, you know, trying to arrange to have those CSAs and then also making sure that it's accessible to folks who who don't have the transportation that they would need to go pick up stuff. It's uh, also about having those at, at um, community centers, for example, like at Moore Court or at uh, Ledgewood and Westgate, if they're, I mean, I know that they have, they've had They've had food programs there and food delivery there, but I, I wonder if specifically uh, the CSA model might work there as a, as a central. I've been, um, all of the CSAs um, and actually all of the, and I don't know if we have any farmers on this call, recognizing it's a terrible time of year and a terrible time of day to have any farmer on a phone call. So, um, but I know that CSAs and even, you know, um, all of the tools one might need to grow their own food have were sold out very, very, very early this year. Um, the farmers I've talked to didn't have to advertise their CSAs this year because they sold out before they usually even get out the gate. Um, and so I'm sort of curious about the implications of that for food security for folks who might not, um, you know, be moving that fast or have the resources um, to be stockpiling compost. Yeah, there's a, a, um, another mechanism that that did not get funded right now, and maybe the Senate will fund it. Or is for for access is is the 
existing program for farmers markets. Um, and there was a grant proposal uh, that came before the Commerce Committee um, and the Commerce Committee chose not to not to fund it, but not because we didn't like the idea, um, but it was it was dollars that would have allowed the current EBT program, um, the um, uh, farmers market program run by NOFA that allows for uh, the three squares dollars to be used at farmers markets. It would have doubled the dollars so that if you had twenty dollars to spend you know, it would make it $40 at the site. So double the, the purchasing power of the of those dollars. And that's something that WIC does every year. Yep. For and, WIC and so, um, it's another million, I think it was a million dollar ask um, to do that. Maybe it was less, but it was, um, it was I think, uh, hope that the Senate might take that up. It was just a situation where, uh, and, and I, I'm actually going to name this out loud, the, the ag committee in the house really got very, very focused on the dairy crisis and um, put all of their resources to supporting the dairy crisis and then ended up with some funding requests that came in after they'd made their decision that would have been part of a more holistic view of the of the food system as a whole. And, um, and this is a very, something that, that I think is worth saying and I do see all the hands and so I'll try to be quick with this. It's just that, um, we're going to lose businesses, and those businesses are going to be across a variety of different sectors, but sectors that are most impacted by COVID in terms of gathering, um, restaurants, you know, other kinds of places that really depend on people being able to be together are, um, are probably not all going to survive, and we're starting to see notices of places around the state that have given up. That's the hard reality of the moment we're in, and and the dairy industry. I I believe that the dairy, the number of active cow dairies is I think about a third of what it was when I first started in the legislature on the agriculture committee eight years ago, um, and we cannot provide enough resources to prop up the Vermont dairy industry in the way that it has been run, because the macro forces of the economy and where that industry is going are so much bigger than what we can do. So the, I think the question should be where, you know, more on the strategic side of what are the ways that we can create a really high quality Vermont scale dairy system that uh, has enough, um, enough people participating in it that there's some economies of scale around the things that make an industry work um, but but maybe also recognize that the macro trends externally are much bigger than we can handle. I apologize for the, the philosophy, I, but I've, I've lost track. I think Millicent was next and Wes. Before, I just want to add that that's why the VHCB investment is so important because they provide really um, sensitive, adaptive technical assistance along with their funding. Um, and so are really helpful at um, folks who want to trans use funding to for any kind of transition in their business model. Millicent, thanks for your patience. Hi, thank you. Um, you mentioned, um, Tristan mentioned the impact on businesses, um, business sectors, including restaurants. Um, and you've mentioned Stephanie Bonin. Um, so I just wanna bring that, her, her projects up again. Um, she recently ran a, a program for um, DBA that was innovative in, in um, using matching grant funds to pay local downtown restaurants to, to um, provide meals for artists. That program was successful and they was, it provided, I think, um, around 300 meals in total, like over a span of six weeks. And what she told me was, and Tony and I both have been helping with this program, so um, that's over. And she told me that the FEMA, the state FEMA people, and I think this must be what you're, might be what you're referring to, that the state FEMA people, um, that, that FEMA nationwide had been looking at things like MREs in a, in a massive emergency. MREs, like factory produced meals that uh, will keep people alive. And we're looking for local alternatives that would support, sustain that would, we're looking for ideas for local alternatives that would sustain, you know, local economies, and that would be 
tastier <laughs> for people. And programs like hers got their attention, and so she's getting funded. Now, I have a feeling we're talking about the same thing, but I, because I, I don't know all the acronyms for the different groups. But her program that recently ended involved paying, it, it benefited local restaurants as well as the people receiving the meals. That's the model that she used. And she's just gotten funded again. And I think it's to the tune of like 600 for a few weeks, 600 meals a week or something like that. So um, <clears throat> I'm, assume, I'm kind of assuming that it also involves helping the local restaurants. I don't know that for a fact. That's the, the program that Tristan um, was explaining at the beginning with Sevka um, participating. That's, um, that's okay. sort of a build out of that exact program and trying to make it so that the food is packaged in a way that's sort of stable enough that it can be distributed a little more broadly. Okay. And right. Yeah, and substantially scaled, which is great. You know, and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. It may become um, a very powerful model. You know, just again, a high level piece uh, here is that we don't know how long this will go, this crisis will continue in this way. And we don't know if the federal government will provide more stimulus, more you know, relief dollars at a future point. But if this program is successful and the crisis is ongoing and the need is there and there are more resources, we will then be able to push money right out through that system again because we'll have created some scale there. Um, which you know could could be incredibly important. Um, I think Bob's got his hand up next, and there are a couple comments in the in the comment thread that we'll circle back to in a minute. So, I was going to try to do some numbers without without like getting everybody dazed with numbers, but you mentioned whether this crisis is going to go on or not. I just happened to see a report. Uh, that came out yesterday, the day before, from the St. Louis Fed that said that food scarcity was in 2018 at 4.3% nationwide, went to 9% uh, at the onset of COVID, and in June was at 10.4%. So whether this is going to continue or not is, is, is interesting. Um, other numbers real locally uh, when you mention number of meals, there are two meal sites in Brattleboro that are still functioning uh, at a pretty high capacity. Loaves and Fishes at Center Church is producing 100 meals for the two days that they operate, Tuesdays and Fridays, that are then distributed by Groundworks to the folks who are uh, temporarily housed in hotels. Um, another 35 and another 45 meals are basically grab and go meals that are also distributed by FoodWorks to people who connect with the FoodWorks site. Um, another 10 to 15 meals per those two days is for people, and I think the person from Strolling of the Heifers mentioned this, people who are challenged with transportation or people who walk downtown, those 10 or 15 people who pick up those meals are people without transportation who are sort of used to just getting a meal at the meal site. Bridget's Kitchen on Walnut Street um, does another 100 hot meals per Monday and Thursday now. They've scaled back because of COVID, and a lot of the extras go to Food Works for distribution. There are some terms of art. Both of these places are called meal sites. Bridget's also operates a pantry. Their pantry now operates on Wednesdays. On their Wednesday pantry, they give out about 35 pound pantry boxes when available with meat, milk, veggies, and eggs. They are looking for fresh vegetables and hoping to find a solution for that need. Uh, they also have folks who are at um, the Elliott Street uh, high rise who don't have transportation, have requests in for meals, and they have a system of delivering those pantry boxes there. Um, so there might be there might be some connection with the farms and the, and there there are some connections with the farms um, already uh, and the meal sites. Um, 
those are those numbers. Thank you, Bob. Um, I don't know if you're frozen or if you're done talking, um, but I'll add two things while that gets sorted out. One, the, um, uh, the appropriation that I hadn't named in my original summary that had drifted out of the brain in the absence of the post-it note was um, a few million dollars to go to senior meal sites, um, which is often done through Meals on Wheels and Senior Solutions collaborations. And so that's a really important part of the food system, especially for folks who can't get out and about. Um, and also want to bring into the room to add on to your numbers something that Margaret Atkinson, who's the co-chair of the Hunger Council, shared with me yesterday that I think is really important to remember that during the last recession, when our food insecurity in Brattleboro spiked significantly, um, we haven't actually, the numbers didn't really ever go down from there. And so remembering that we're already, we're starting this um, experience of the pandemic with significant need in our community and we're, we're adding to it. And so making sure that as we build new systems, we are meeting the needs of the folks um, who are already in need before this started and that we're not creating two parallel systems of um, services. Lissa, do you, would you like to floor again? I'm gonna concede my time to Marilyn if she wants it because we may, may be talking about similar things. Great. Marilyn? Hmm, there you go. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, when I saw the $50 million in the governor's um, proposal to uh, the dairy industry, much of which is very large industrial dairy farming, um, I really thought that a lot of that money should go to small farms, and especially those that want to transition into regenerative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture has many benefits, providing ecosystem services in terms of filtering water that reaches our water tables, um, building healthy soil that is more resilient to flooding and, and, and drought, um, providing a healthier product. It, 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 it just has so many benefits. It'll clean up Lake Champlain because you won't have all that nitrogen going into the, the lakes. And it would start a movement, uh, which has already started actually, an enhance a movement, um, of regenerating our soils here in Vermont and hopefully eventually nationwide. But we could be on the forefront of that. And regenerative agriculture products could be so labeled and would also bring in a, uh, I would think, a better financial component for the farmers. A part of the support would be um, helping farmers to transition, supporting those farmers who, who are providing ecosystem services already uh, whether it's a measurement through the carbon content in the soils, how much they're sequestering from the, from the, uh, uh, the atmosphere into the soils as a result of the kind of work that they're doing. Um, I, I really think this is a time that we should take the opportunity to support that growing need. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, so again, hopeful that the Working Lands Funds can um, support folks who want to transition while um, also some folks are really just so deep in debt right now that um, they need a way of... Yeah, and the working uh, land money... Um, what? Yeah, and the working land's money is grant money, so it yeah. doesn't... It, it gives people, you know, people will be able to use some of those funds to transition um, without incurring more debt, which is a crucial element. Because it's really... Um, a particularly with the situation that we're having with the real estate market right now in um, Wyndham County. I have a lot of concerns that if we, um, if farms aren't supported to get out of their debt, that we will wind up with that land um, becoming um, homes rather than farms. And people need homes, but we also need farms so we can eat. Um, and so making sure that, you know, farmland stays farmland, I think is really important for this area, particularly. Um, and then there was a, we had a bill about ecosystem services that we passed many months ago. And I, I'm, thank you. I don't remember if it was part of Act 250 legislation or not. So thank you, Marilyn. I will go find that thread and figure out where it went after we passed it. I don't know if it became law or if it got stuck in the Senate. 
I believe that the Act 250 amendment from the House is sitting in the House Natural, I mean, the Senate Natural Resources Committee. I, that I'm sure of. Um, there's been some good press about that lately, but I'm curious. Um, I don't know if the Ecosystem Services was in Act 250 or if it was somewhere else. Do you remember that? Uh, that I don't remember. Okay. I think it was the Act 250, but I'm not sure. And I think the whole point of the Working Lands came from a report that the Vermont Council on Rural Development did about how Vermonters value the landscape and the working landscape and how to um, protect that you know, through helping farms, helping farm and forest industries. So it's just an interesting connection to even to tourism and things like that to, to preserve that, that working landscape. So just to follow up to what um, Marilyn was saying, something a uh, long-term thought that we had um, was a regenerative um, uh, education center. So the idea being that a certain amount of acres would be devoted to helping farmers learn how to do regenerative farming without having to um, turn over their own farms right away and figuring out how they want to do that, um, but not making the commitment um, and possibly uh, affecting their revenues. But, um, but also in the short term too, um, thinking about uh, um, materials and things for folks to be able to do homestead and community gardening um, as, a, as a solution to food security, food insecurity. So do you see, is there a place um, where some resources might come from the state um, to be able to do that in our community? Um, I think there's a tension between um, funding going to farms who have um, you know, even smaller farms, um, like the, you know, many of the vegetable farms that we have in our area, such as, you know, wild carrot, um, providing funding to them for their business model and the um, efficiencies of scale that even a small farm can have with food production and um, putting that money into community gardens, which um, are generally not as efficient a source of food production, but have a lot of other really important um, community values going into them. And so um, I think in a very straightforward way, the answer is no, I don't see money right now going to community gardens from the state. However, there is funding for um, something called the Better Places Project, which is investments in community building um, and investments in sort of projects that bring communities together to make those communities more resilient and better places to live. And I could see that being a source of community garden funds. And I think there are a lot of ways we can support the town in supporting community gardens, but I don't see a specific grant from the state just for that. It would be around sort of placemaking or resiliency or something like that. Um, what was the name of that organization? Better, better Places? It's a program of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and it's called Better Places Project, and we just put some funding into that with the appropriation that we passed out yesterday. I don't know if that means that it will survive um, all of the sausage making yet to come, but um, it's something that the Agency of Commerce has been pretty excited about for a while. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. The, uh, the current version has one million um, allocated to it and I'm, I'm looking for the language uh, to explain but somebody else should go ahead. Um, Patsy. Patsy you're muted so just wait one second. I can't seem to unmute you. Are you trying to unmute yourself? Yeah. There we go. Okay. I have sort of been working in the West Brattleboro community through um, Chelsea Royal Diner for several years in terms of food. So I'm going to call myself a food worker in that way <laughs> for the moment and, and ask, uh, I know Bob talked about various programs that are going on, but because of the work that the Chelsea Royal Diner has done over the years to provide food for uh, the communities, the, the uh, next door and across the road, across Route 9, uh, who are um, 
outliers. They're not able to walk to uh, River Garden to collect food. They're not able to walk to these places in town. And they walk. And uh, carrying loads of, you know, bags of stuff. But Chelsea Royal really was a, um, an interesting support system for these groups. I don't, I wonder now, I don't hear anything about how food is, how food uh, support is going to those communities. And I'm wondering about that. I don't live in West Rock, but I'm very aware of so um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I reached out to TriPark um, board uh -huh. to see um, what mountain home residents needed specifically in this time. And so we worked with the school system to make sure that the school food bus delivery, um, which usually was just going to um, the bus stop, which is there's only one bus stop in TriPark, and that's a very long walk from some parts of the area, especially for children to do alone. And so worked with them to figure out a, a distribution system for the folks that, um, for the food that was coming there with the school buses, um, have been connecting them more closely with Senior Meals and with the Groundworks um, Food Shelf, which does food delivery systems, and are continuing those conversations to make sure that the services in our wider community can be adapted to the particular environment of Mountain Home. Um, Bringing in the housing development that's directly across the street, that's Wyndham Wizard Housing Trust, mm -hmm. is um, for some reason more complicated. And they have, while well, they have a sort of resident community director position who um, is doing some of that work, I would really like to find systems so we can bring both of those communities together for food access. And that sort of feels like the next step in this process. And thank you for, I was, just went to the Chelsea for ice cream the other day. It was like my first, it was my first fa family outing to buy food in public since the mm -hmm. pandemic started. And um, yeah. it just, I was so struck by how like beautiful the lands around there have really become. Well, and it's, it's interesting, but when I went out uh, at, a, at a point, not knowing, realizing that it had closed yet, um, I, the owner's name is, is it Tony? Is Tony the guy who owns the Chelsea Royal? I can't remember. Um, he, uh, I, I was taking them money to, anyway, that's the part of the thing that I have been doing over the years, but he just said when he heard what I'd been doing, he said, oh, would you like some eggs? I, I, he gave me flats of eggs because, as he said, the, the chickens don't realize that the diner's closed, so he gave me flats of eggs to distribute to people which I did, um, and they were so generous, they're so generous in their mentality with the community that, for which they are, with the community center there, that if there is a way to, to tap, I mean, there might be a way to tap into that and, and use, use that energy that is already built as everybody coming in. And I would be happy to work on that if there is some way. I don't know. You know. I would, can I put my email address in the chat and you and I can follow up after this? I'd love to. Okay, let's do that. Okay, super. Thank you. I'm noticing that we're at 10. I, um, I, I don't know if there are, I haven't seen any new hands in a couple of minutes, I would just offer that I think that we gave a pretty good legislative update in the context of the conversation. Um, and I'll just add a couple, um, the other really big item in the, um, or two, two items, I think Molly mentioned it earlier that I wanna flag around the bill that the House passed yesterday for uh, economic recovery dollars. One is that it sets aside five million, two and a half million each for uh, women and minority-owned businesses, um, which is, uh, in the context of the total dollars, actually a pretty substantial shift. But it's more, I think, important than its shift in thinking to recognize that um, women-owned businesses and, and minority-owned businesses are uh, historically, um, structurally denied access to the same level of resources and support, um, and 
and then for the first time that I, that I can remember in these conversations, a real understanding that in order to begin to alter that equation, we have to actually specifically set aside and prioritize resources for minority owned businesses and women owned businesses. Um, so that's an interesting pivot that we've we've started. In, um, and then the other piece is that uh, the first wave of money that was passed last week for economic recovery was targeted at businesses that were tax paying businesses of certain types that had 75% or more loss over the previous year's period threshold in the second wave of set another 70 million is, is dropped to 50% um, and uh, nonprofits are eligible for it as well. So there's a, the eligibility has shifted a little bit. It still needs to be you know, 50% or more loss in revenue over a previous period um, that's provable, but it, the criteria has expanded a little bit more. Uh, and there, the work of that, assuming that this passes in the next week, um, the work of getting that up and running will happen very quickly. Uh, and so people who are interested in accessing those funds should be paying very close attention to uh, communications from the state, from us. We'll certainly announce any details as we get them of where people can go um, to, to find resources. So just just to flag for, for folks listening and also for folks on the call here to share with others that that these programs uh, are getting very, very close to, to being live and there'll be a, a quick rush to get in the pipeline for resources. And they're all, they're both designed, the big programs are, big, are designed to be very, very quick in the turnaround. And so they're running through the tax department and it's a fair, it will be a fairly simple process uh, once it's up and running. And so next week we are, um, next week is, hypothetically the last week of this um, section of the session and then we're going to take about um, six weeks off of legislating something like that some approximate period of time um, of legislating and then we're going to come back again in august september to do some more work on budget issues because we don't have enough um, information right now to make those final decisions and so normally the biennium would have wrapped up in may we've extended it um, through june we're going to take a break in july and some part of august and then come back again in august september to finish up our work and so next week we are going to spend this hour at our round table talking about the specifically sort of capping off this part of the legislative cycle and talking about what's passed, especially um, these appropriations <laughs> relief. And then we're gonna take a brief break, um, come back and talk about um, follow up to our racial justice conversation, have a few more topical conversations while we're not legislating. So there won't be legislative updates, it'll just be conversations about <laughs> what folks want and need and directions we're going. And then we'll be sort of rejoining the legislative process in a more regular cycle of our meetings. Um, so please, really nice to see some new faces and new names this week and really hoping you all can come back and stay tuned. There are ways that we can improve these meetings or improve our publicity around these meetings. Please let us know. Um, would very much, very much looking for feedback to make this as robust as it can be. <laughs>